Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm kind of a wanderer when I talk, but I need to stay in front of this uh, big brother looking um, camera here. Um, first of all, uh, happy Pi Day, everybody. March 14th, happy Pi Day. Uh, in honor of Pi Day, we have oops, uh, <laughs> kind of the same, right? Uh, Pi Day, uh, we can also honor Stephen Hawking, passed away yesterday. Uh, great, great physicist and mathematician, well known for many things, including trying to come up with the, the theory of everything. Uh, my math teachers were more like Pete, if you could come up with the theory of anything, that would be that would be great. But, um, so, anyways, well, hey, my job uh, today is to welcome you. Uh, to um, the kickoff for Solar Possible. And uh, we're going to have a great morning. Um, so my job is to welcome you and also to provide a bit of a, I guess, uh, a 30,000 foot view um, of where we're at with, with uh, solar and local government today. And then I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues uh, to go a little bit, a little bit deeper. This is uh, a home court advantage for me here this morning because uh, my job, my, my, my day job, so to speak, is local government outreach coordinator with the clean energy resource teams. My night gig is the mayor of Falcon Heights. We are in Falcon Heights City Hall right now. So uh, welcome to the great city of Falcon Heights. Let's talk about CERTs for a minute, clean energy resource teams. We have a very straightforward mission, and that is to help individuals and communities do clean energy projects all across the state. We've been around for, gosh, uh, 15 years, give or take, and um, we're all across the state. Uh, we have four key partners that make up the clean energy resource teams. One is what's called the Southwest Regional Development Commission down in the southwest part of the state. A nonprofit called the Great Plains Institute here in the Twin Cities. Uh, the University of Minnesota is a key partner with CERTS. And last but not least, the state of Minnesota. So that's CERTS. This is what we're going to be talking about today. I hope you can read that. Uh, I'm going to be providing the, the kickoff. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Trevor Drake, to talk about uh, collaborative procurement um, in general. And then we're going to hear from the state of Minnesota, Larry Perkey, Jordan Wentz, uh, and uh, then turn it back over to Trevor uh, to talk about your role and, and next steps in this process. And then we're all going to come up to the front, and you can bombard us with questions and hopefully some answers. And then if you wish, uh, if you have time at around 11 or so, um, up above us right now is a 40 kW solar array. And uh, you are welcome, maybe 10 people at a time or so, uh, to head on up to the roof and uh, check out the, the solar array that is above us. I will warn you, there are some very steep stairs uh, to get up to the roof. Um, and uh, don't be playing any football up there or baseball. Be a little slippery. Um, there's no side rails or anything, so uh, watch your step. But it's going to be fun. So uh, it's right in my job description. Before I can say the word solar, <laughs> before I can say the word solar, I have to talk about energy efficiency. Um, so uh, yeah, Lisa stares at me. Um, naturally, if I don't say energy efficiency. So, um, so the first couple of slides are going to be on energy efficiency, and then we're going to dive into solar. So, um, this actually ties into solar as well, but it's B3 benchmarking. Uh, how many of you cities, uh, counties, schools participate in B3 benchmarking? Excellent. You have? Yeah, good job. Great. So, you're familiar with, with what this is all about. It's a free online tool for cities, counties, and schools uh, to benchmark their energy use for 
their facilities. And it's really slick, very powerful tool. Um, you can measure, and actually this is, uh, this is pretty about the heights, City Hall is on there. Um, so you can measure this building or your building uh, against 7,000 public buildings in the state. 7,000 plus public buildings. So you can measure your city hall of this size that has this feature against other city halls um, of a similar size, similar features, similar use, to know if your building is performing on par or not. Uh, you can measure it against uh, uh, public facilities across the state, across the nation, and then measure it against itself. So over time, gosh, are we using about the same amount of energy we were last year, two years ago, three years ago, more or less? You can kick out some easy reports to show policymakers how your facilities are performing. And if you do uh, B3 benchmarking, and you see, golly, you know what? We've got some opportunities to improve uh, City Hall or your elementary schools, whatever it might be. Then we always encourage you to do an energy audit. And there is a, a state program, State Department of Commerce, called LEAP, Local Energy Efficiency Program. And if you use LEAP, it will provide, LEAP provides technical assistance to help get you this. This is an, an actual energy audit for the city of Bemidji. And it is, as you can see, very detailed analysis about pretty much anything that uses energy uh, with your city facilities. What the payback might be, um, and it's a very helpful tool. And also there's uh, and the Guaranteed Energy Savings Program which helps you implement the projects that the energy audit has identified. Let's start talking about solar. Um, as you are thinking about solar for your own facilities, uh, we encourage you to think about what you can do to help promote solar for your residents, for your businesses. I put up four things here. Two on the left, Grow Solar, Local Government, Solar Toolkit and SolSmart are similar in that they, um, I guess, reduce the red tape, uh, primarily for cities and counties, I uh, think you hear, uh, around planning, around zoning, around permitting. So uh, these are online tools uh, that you can utilize today. Model ordinances are included, makes it very easy. Also, both MREA, the Midwest Renewable Energy Association, and an, uh, an organization called Solar United Neighbors, these are bulk purchasing uh, programs for, for uh, homeowners primarily. We're talking about bulk purchasing today for local governments. These two entities are bulk purchasing for homeowners. Cities um, uh, can be involved here by providing space, helping get the word out in your newsletters, on your website. So we encourage you to think about that as well. Now, uh, let's uh, start heading from 30,000 down, maybe a, a nice a smooth descent to uh, 20,000 feet level here, and talk about options for cities, counties, and schools for solar. You do have options. That's the good news and uh, four options in particular. The top two are similar, have a lot of similarities. Green tariffs uh, and uh, community solar farms. Lots of similarities between the two. The green tariff that's available in Excel territory, which I think most of you, if not all of you are in Excel territory, is called Excel Renewable Connect for Government. As I mentioned, there are similarities between Renewable Connect and community solar gardens in the sense that uh, there's no solar on, you, on the top of your facilities. Uh, it, is, it is renewable energy that you are subscribing to, that you are purchasing. And there are a few key differences. 
key differences are the Renewable Connect, the Excel program, you get the RECs, the Renewable Energy Certificates. And this, I suspect many of you are familiar with RECs. If you want to make the claim that your facility or facilities are using renewable energy, you have to have those renewable energy certificates or credits. Um, community solar gardens oftentimes um, do not include those credits. You can say that you subscribe to a community solar garden, um, but you can't say that your facility is using renewable energy. Savings. Uh, community solar gardens, oftentimes right off the bat, you're going to see savings the day that you subscribe. Uh, Re uh, Renewable Connect comes at a premium. You will be paying a, a slight premium above what, are, what you're paying today for your energy. Um, now, to go in a little bit more detail, there's a uh, an escalator with Renewable Connect, and it, if you do the modeling, it could be that if the utility rate keeps going up at 3.5% or so, it would take, that the utility rate could catch up to that uh, premium price you're paying, even with the escalator, and, and surpass it. So in the long run, you could be saving money with Renewable Connect, but nobody knows what the increase in the utility rate will be for sure. For certain. So um, I did not uh, include that, did not check the box. One benefit uh, with Renewable Connect is flexibility. Community Solar Gardens, 25 year contract. You're signing up for 25 years. Um, sometimes that can be uh, a tough thing for policymakers to swallow. Uh, Renewable Connect, month to month, five year term, 10 year term. A little bit more flexible. Um, and certainly, both I would say are you're encouraging clean energy in the state. So it's it's really what do you want to do, what, what you, where do you want to go as um, as a local government or a school? Is it really incredibly important to you that you have those recs that you can claim that you're using renewable energy to advance your um, sustainability plan? Your climate action plan, for example, or is savings more, more important? Those other two uh, options third party solar financing and direct purchase. Third party, you have it on your facility. Direct purchase, you have it on your facility or ground mounted on your property. Uh, there are advantages and challenges to each one of these options. Third party, that's what we have on the, the roof above us today. Uh, huge advantage, no upfront costs. It is a third party that owns the array. A third party that maintains the array. Um, so, so you as a city, county school, you're essentially getting an array, 40 kW, 100 kW, 500 kW, for zilch upfront costs. Now, how does that happen? You as a local government or school are signing a power purchase agreement. So you are agreeing through a contract to purchase the power at a set rate that that solar array creates over time. A common term is 20 years. So one of the clear advantages is that you're getting a solar array for, for no upfront costs. That third party is also able to take advantage of the federal tax credits and accelerated depreciation. So they, you as a local government or school, you don't pay taxes, you don't get a tax credit. A third party company does pay taxes. They do get the tax credit. They do take advantage of accelerating depreciation. And ideally, because of that, they can offer you a lower uh, power purchase rate. The challenge with third party arrangements, 
Uh, I can tell you firsthand, it took us a year, uh, this is back in 2011, to just work through all the contracts, all the issues. Gosh, we're signing up for a long time. This is kind of new. Um, what is this all about? So it's, it's an investment in time for your staff and your policy makers. Um, there's a buyout uh, option, typically. Um, after the tax credit has been taken, after the accelerated depreciation has been captured by the company. So it's typically on year seven or later. Um, and it's uncertain what that price will be if the company wishes to sell it to you, to you the local government. It's uncertain what that price will be. So that's a challenge. Let's talk about direct purchase. Um, pretty straightforward. It's just like a similar uh, project that a, a school or a, a local government would purchase. You buy it, you own it, you have more control over that purchase. Uh, uh, the challenge is you buy it. <laughs> <laughs> and you are competing that solar array for uh, $150,000 or $500,000, you're competing against that fire truck that also needs to be purchased, that playground or textbooks or whatever it might be. So that's a challenge. You're also maintaining it uh, over the lifetime of the event. And you can't take advantage of uh, the tax credits. But there are key advantages. You, have, you as a government have access to uh, low cost capital. You can bond for something and maybe you get a rate of two and a half percent or so. Um, and maybe over the long term, that could be financially uh, better off than um, doing a third party arrangement and uh, um, maybe paying a little bit higher uh, on your power purchase. Let's let this one soak in for a moment. I would say that. Local governments and schools that move forward uh, with solar on their own facilities, you're the leading edge. Um, you're not the bleeding edge. This has been around for quite a while. Solar, in general, has been around for three decades or so. But th these types of arrangements uh, have been around, well, we, for uh, seven, eight years. Give or take. Um, so we have City of Falcon Heights has a 40 kW array, um, Maplewood, um, Woodbury, Oakdale they have 40 kW arrays. Shoreview is uh, close to signing on the dotted line for 123 kW array. Um, Farmington Public Schools 700. KW plus uh, went online last year. And Brooklyn Park wins the, wins the prize, I do believe, for the largest uh, city facility. Uh, just recently went online in the last six months or so. 1.5 megawatt solar array. And one thing to keep in mind is these are not all on one facility. You can have a school that has solar on three different elementary schools, a middle school, and a high school. So you're seeing 30 different um, entities, and there's, there's probably hundreds of different public facilities with solar on them or around them. Direct purchase, uh, a little bit less. And by the way, this is just a sampling. When I, when I started a few years ago, I, I thought I kept hearing about these things, um, but I, I didn't have a list, so I started a list. And, and uh, so there are there are likely um, more entities that, that are just on here on this slide. And there are likely more on this slide as well. These are local governments and schools that have done uh, direct purchase. Often it is made feasible by grants, particularly grants from Excel, the Global Development Fund, grant, um, or stimulus funds were used to years ago. And this is my favorite project of all time. Uh, this is the city of Hutchinson, and they have a 400 kW array. What's 
cool, there's two things that are super cool about this. Number one, that's their wastewater treatment. Largest energy user in the city of Hutchinson. They installed the 400 kW array. It's behind the meter, so it's powering the wastewater treatment plant. And what's super cool is that it's on a 1970s, 1980s closed landfill. Closed landfill. You can't use it for anything else. You're never going to build a home or a business on a closed landfill. You can't do anything. But you know what? Solar panels, they don't mind being on a closed <laughs> land. They don't mind at all. And so it's it's a great it's a great story. So so we've been hearing we at certs have been hearing uh, the last couple of years about uh, local governments and schools that are really interested in solar and being approached by developers and the developer comes and says, Hey, I'm going to present you with this proposal. And then another developer comes and says, well, here's my proposal. And oftentimes, they're very different. Very difficult to make an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. And they would, these local governments and schools would come to search and say, gosh, can you help us out, uh, work through these challenging questions? And so uh, Woodbury was one of those local governments. And so for the last year or so, uh, we've been working with the city of Woodbury. This is the formerly known as the Bielenberg Sports Center, the Health East Sports Center, beautiful facility. Uh, and they have two ice rinks and a large field house. And they're, they are interested in putting solar on one of the ice rinks. And so we worked hand in hand with the city of Woodbury to, to develop a model request for proposal. Generally, a good idea to go out for an RFP instead of just accepting the, the first offer that comes your way. You really want to uh, uh, play the play the field a bit and see what's what's out there, see what you can uh, get for the best price, and the best option for your facility. And so, we've developed a model request for proposals. It's available online right now on the search website. Any city, county, school can, can utilize that tool. And then we thought, gosh. Um, maybe we can combine forces and do a collaborative purchasing program and uh, utilize our, our model RFP, utilize what we learn in terms of information that should be collected ahead of time um, around energy usage and other things and uh, work together. So that's where we're at today. I didn't take too much of my time, but uh, Lisa's going to. I'm going to turn it over to Lisa. Thank you, Pete. Um, so, he just walked you up to where we are today in the timeline. Oh, it's fine. I'll just talk with my laptop. If I drop the laptop, then then we'll have some talking to do, maybe. But I think it'll be okay. So, Pete has really brought you up to where we are today. This idea of having the model RFP, and then how do we bring people together to go through a process collaboratively, as opposed to just one jurisdiction doing it one at a time. And with that, Trevor Drake, we will hand it over to you because you are going to talk to us about, well, why would one want to do collaborative purchasing? So here you are on the agenda, moving into benefits and samples. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> My name is Trevor Drake. I'm with the Great Plains Institute. We're a nonprofit based in Minneapolis. Our mission is really to find the intersection between what's good for the environment and what's good for the economy. And to that end, I'm going to talk about collaborative procurement. Uh, I was thinking it would be great for us to have sort of a working definition about collaborative procurement. And so I was researching definitions, and it turns out that the picture really is worth a thousand words in this case. Here you have it. This is collaborative procurement. Um, so I actually want to turn this on to you. So when you see the term collaborative procurement, uh, I'd love to hear from a few people. What does that mean? What do you think? Oh. <laughs> 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 okay, bulk purchase. Yep. Common goal. Thank you. Okay, a school, a good school example. 
community. Okay, so, so for the benefit of many. Anybody else? Okay, yep. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mary. <laughs> Indeed, Sharon. Uh, so I'm going to walk through a case study to sort of lay out uh, an example of library programs. This is a project that we were part of recently called the Governmental Solar Garden Subscriber Collaborative. This was a joint purchase of solar garden subscriptions, so different from purchasing solar on your own site. Um, okay, here's where we are, <laughs> where you get to be. So, uh, June, sorry, spring of 2015, we formed a steering committee. So this included uh, Great Plains and to be sort of, as sort of a convener role, providing engagement expertise, a little bit of technical expertise. The Metropolitan Council played a big role as a, a procurement expert. And then we have these idea champions, happening in the counties and the city of Minneapolis. Um, but together, we wanted to put together an effort to uh, jointly go out for purchase of solar garden subscriptions. So, in June 2015, we had a kickoff meeting, which happened actually in this room, uh, to explain the opportunity. And following that meeting, there was an opportunity for participants to sign these non-binding letters. So here were the rules of the letter. Uh, they had to be submitted pretty quickly. We felt like we had to be there some time. Two months to sign a letter was quick. Uh, it had to come from whoever they deemed to be the proper authority. So our city, that could be city council, or city staff. Um, and they had to declare how much electricity they would want to subscribe to a solar. We said we'll take that total amount and break it into tickets and put them into a line. Assuming that there would be more desire for solar than there would be. So there were 31 different non federal governmental entities that signed those letters on the tax. And uh, using that pool of desired solar subscriptions, the Met Council put out an RFP and said, you would like to buy solar subscriptions, here's solar developers, what can you provide to us? Um, so uh, they led that. They pulled together a selection team that also included participants. Uh, they used sort of a best value approach for making those proposals. And they also led the negotiations. So we went all the way to final contracts. <clears throat> at the end of that, we had five solar vendors offering about 70 megawatts total of solar. Remember, we wanted 180 megawatts. So less than we asked for. So we did have a lot of need to figure out how would those deal. So, there you are. <laughs> yeah, there was cash just flying through the air. <laughs> it was wonderful. That's how all governments always feel. Yeah. <laughs> cash flying through the air. Right. Uh, so we ran this lottery. Uh, everybody got at least one opportunity to subscribe. Here were the rules. Uh, participants could only accept any money. So there was no contract negotiation allowed. It's yes or no. We'll take what we offer. Um, and again, they were allowed to decide what they were going to offer. So we didn't. Uh, it was really a short timeline to take action. We provided a lot of technical assistance in the process. So we did a webinar, uh, we had a phone call, we sent out a spreadsheet that let people do some of the potential analysis of those uh, subscription offers. And uh, we actually didn't plan for this, but participants were talking to one another about uh, their opinions around. Uh, one city reach out to another, you've got the same offer, you think it's a good idea to forward with this or not. So here are the results of that project. There were 44 entities represented in the trip off As I said, 31 signed letters of intent, uh, and then 24 ended up actually signing for some sort of solar garden subscription. Totally about 35 megawatts or so. So remember there was 70 megawatts offered. Some of those offers were deemed to be not favorable. Uh, and some of them just decided, you know, we went through this whole process and it, it just wasn't right. So we're glad they were a part of it. We learned a lot, but we're just not going to act to them. We followed up with those folks and asked them some questions about the benefits of participating in that collaborative process. And here's what we asked them. So, uh, did, you, did you think you got better pricing than you got? If you can't read this, I should say, uh, more bars to the right means, yes, they thought that was a big advantage. More bars to the left means no, that actually wasn't. Um, better pricing, we're kind of neutral to the So 
but I would fall in the neutral category. It's really hard to measure that, but I'm not sure we actually got better pricing than we would have if people went through. Uh, on the bottom left, reduced staff time. So pretty solid agreement that yes, this is a benefit. So even though we didn't get better pricing for the subscriptions themselves, people saved resources in the department which also took on the role of running network of uh, faster entry to market, so getting to a subscription quicker, uh, rough there as well, maybe new. So uh, we ran into some issues along the way. We were able to resolve those, but it did expand our timeline. The total time period was still about a year, so pretty, pretty, pretty quick, you know, not, not like three years, um, but speed maybe okay. And then lastly, so we hadn't actually, as I said, planned for peer learning to be part of this, but we asked about it in the end because we saw it happening, and it turns out this was a huge benefit. Folks are participating. So they saw value in being able to talk to them about the offers they received. Uh, a few quotes from participants significantly reduced the expenditures. Uh, we didn't even do this with current staffing. The tools provided were really helpful with communicating to elected officials, creating a bigger than just us. Okay, <laughs> more dogs. Uh, so I actually want to ask you all, what what brought you here? What sort of goal did you have in mind when you showed up? I don't need an answer. Okay. <laughs> uh, let me ask this a different way. What were you hoping to? I got one back here. Yeah. Indeed. <laughs> sure. Okay, that's actually a great example. And I presented them. Those are some really great uh, critical questions asked in that process. Uh, other, other, yeah, right here. You kind of think about this, Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> we hope you will. Wonderful, thank you. So, uh, great responses. And the reason I ask is, uh, I kind of I'm going to walk through some of the benefits of collaborative solar procurement, and I want you to be thinking about if this is a fit for you or not. Uh, and I want to be really clear: this is an opportunity. There are lots of opportunities to procure solar. This is just one of them. And as, as Pete talked about, there are other clean energy opportunities. So, let's let's talk about. It. Um, so, reduce staff time. I think this is a clear benefit of collaborative solar because an entity is taking on uh, all of the thought process of figuring out what is this going to look like, what are the steps, what is the, they're going to write the RFP, they're going to handle negotiations. Um, that takes a lot of the burden off the shoulders of individual entities going down the list. Um, a structure for collaboration. So uh, there are some benefits to having a number of entities following the same process, the same structure. Uh, one of them is that it allows a group like CERT and the Great Plains Institute to provide technical assistance to the whole group because everybody's following the same process so we can apply technical assistance at specific steps. This is helpful. So there was mention of uh, those one-on-one -on -one meetings that we have with Woodbury. We are looking to provide that same level of assistance, but to do that effectively it helps to have everybody do uh, This is an opportunity to build internal capacity. So if you've been looking at solar and not sure what to do, this is a process that you can be part of. And I'll talk a little bit a little bit later about kind of the no consequence exit point. So you can be part of the process to a point and then decide, yeah, it's not for us and no problem, no penalty. Uh, and then the opportunity for peer learning. So if you go out alone to buy solar, you can talk to other local governments that have done it, uh, but they won't be in your same shoes. With a collaborative process, they will in a sense uh, be in your and then lastly, economy of scale. So there is an opportunity to get better pricing uh, and better contract terms. And to put a little definition to that, uh, there was a collaborative solar procurement process that in Northern California that did some measurement around price reduction. So on this chart, on the far left side is total system cost. On the far right, that is the net system cost, what people actually pay. The orange bars are the cost reductions, but the top left, that top left most uh, orange bar, was a 12% reduction that they saw from the group purchase, so the bulk price of discount. All the other orange bars are incentives and depreciation and other things like that. So uh, they saw a pretty significant cost reduction, but still the bulk purchase was not the biggest chunk. So I just want to be clear, it's an opportunity, but uh, it, it's a small piece of the pie. So why not do this? What are some of the problems? Better pricing is not necessarily good. We won't know until an RFP is issued. The standardized process has some drawbacks. So if you want to have individual control over every step, uh, or you want a, a really customized process, you've got a really unique situation. Uh, with a collaborative procurement, there is just some element of being sort of uh, beholden to the individual. So that's just something to think about and we can talk about. And then lastly, the speed of it. So if you want to move really fast, you're on a timeline that you just love and this timeline doesn't fit, that's also a uh, And lastly, so roles and responsibilities, sort of best practice, what is this? Normally in collaborative procurement for solar, there are four main roles. Um, in, in this case, CERT and GPI are taking on two of them, which is the convener, the one that sort of brings everybody together with meetings like this, does webinars, does the engagement, and the technical assistance provider. So who's providing sort of a one-on-one -on -one uh, we are taking that on. The procurement lead, so in my case study that was the Met Council, um, they also need a lot of technical expertise but they're applying that to the RFP. 
they are communicating with the vendors during that process. And right now we're working with the Department of Administration groups to come up with a whole of that is approved. Uh, and then last is the participants. So participants have a big role in this. They contribute sites into the process. That takes staff time. Uh, and it also takes time to evaluate the we will come back to kind of next steps in specific topics, but before we do that, we'll turn it over to this one. Any quick questions from any of you about this part so far? We've done you into silence. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that the next presentation is going to have doggy pictures, so. Yeah. Good question. So, uh, in the Solar Garden one, those ended up in consolidated sites. You have five entities subscribing to the garden that's only on one garden somewhere. Uh, in this case, we are actually seeking information on the site of the local participants. So, to participate in this, you put in at least one building that your entity owns, uh, and there's an evaluation process to make sure that that building is suitable for solar. But at the end, you would have solar on your own. It wouldn't be shared. Well, we'll have to talk. To, so, I mean, for a net meter system, you still have to abide by the net metering rules. If it's a behind the meter, you know, you're sizing it to fulfill your energy needs. So, if you'll still need to abide by all of the laws that govern net metering and all of that. Um, and part of what we'll talk about as we get into it is the data that you'll need to collect about understanding your energy usage and all of that. So, we'll go into that. Let's do one more and then we're going to go on. Sean. It, it could be done, and there's actually a good case study about private sector collaborative procurement. In this case, we are only working with the public sector. So, city and counties. Uh, I'll follow up with you. Yeah. City and county schools, state agencies, non federal government agencies. Perfect. Thank you for those questions. And with that, I can tell you're all like, okay, let's get into the details. Um, so, Trevor mentioned that we've been working with the Department of Administration and specifically their Office of Enterprise Sustainability. And Larry Perky and Jordan Wentz from the Office of Enterprise Sustainability are here. They're going to talk to you about sort of what does this RFP process look like? How does that work? And they're going to talk to you about a master RFP that they are already working on and then that, how that would dovetail into some site specific RFPs that would be for your own facility. And with that, sir, I will hand you the clicker. Thank you. Yes. Good morning. Uh, no dog pictures here. Uh, my wife keeps asking about the cat pictures. She's showing me the cat pictures all night long. It's nice in front. But uh, I have with me today, I'm uh, Larry Herkey from the Office of Enterprise Sustainability. It's a fairly new office in the state government, about 18 months. Uh, we are been pretty successful so far. We got an executive order and some things moving ourselves along as it relates to uh, state agencies. And with me today, I brought Jordan Lindy. He's a uh, program manager actually for the sustainability reporting tool, which will be a tool that can be used for local government in the future. But today, uh, he's, he's reusing the other part of his expertise, which is his uh, renewable energy. He's an instrument program. So, technical questions. <laughs> no. um, my interest in solar started uh, a few years ago. I guess I started the uh, situation with uh, the facility manager for the missile armories in Chicago. It's responsible for all the armories, and flight facilities, and so forth, about 5 million square feet uh, of built space with Minnesota. So I know that the is in the cities and school districts here, so it's to keep the buildings up and so forth. And armories are going about 3 years old. 
one of the challenges was I had the requirements for renewable energy from the federal government at that time. And uh, we worked a program with, uh, in this case, a public private program with the utility, which was going to sort of power. We were able to negotiate over a period of 18 months a 10 megawatt solar uh, system on Cape River. We were able to get the RECs, we were able to get a lot of benefits of that. I saw how beneficial that was to our operations, and I wanted to carry some of that into um, state government. So for about the last 18 months, we've been working on what you're going to see here um, going forward. So a lot of staff work has already been involved with this where we are here today. I did also want to say, why is this important to the state of Minnesota? For us, really, then, uh, solar on-site demonstrates a visible commitment to renewable energy. I think that's important. We've had our first installation um, on the capital complex recently. We had some of our other, like the UNR um, installations on their sites, and um, of course, the department located theirs. The second thing is it reduces operational costs uh, associated with consumption of energy and peak demand charges. So, for a lot of our agencies, we're looking at where their peak demands are and trying to uh, balance you know, when we're actually producing that energy, see if those things can match up. And we do envision in the future that that is part of the um, challenge also. Um, we're here as an office to assist the state agencies in achieving the greenhouse gas goals. We have a very aggressive greenhouse gas goal of 30% reduction by 2025. It's in statute, and we're helping raise the agencies to get that goal. And lastly, if uh, Lieutenant Governor and Alex Senator Smith, Tina Smith, was here, she would say this is what Minnesota consultants want us to do. I do believe that that based on the discussion. So with that, so our mission statement is pretty straightforward. We're here to help state agencies in the future, I think, to the care they will take in local governments. We've done a lot of work already with local governments, helping them ensure that we save um, operations, money, and social social environmental uh, responsible solutions. Um, our solar procurement, again, the 30% uh, reduction of greenhouse gas is probably the most challenging of the six focus area goals that we're working on. It's the one where solar can help the most. Uh, we have been working on the solar master contract proposal working for about 22 months. Um, this envisions an on site solar, as I've talked about before, so it's something that will be on your site. And we prefer um, in the RFP. That, that would be owned by, by the state of Minnesota in the case of the um, local government and um, owned by the government itself. I should say that um, besides all state agencies being available for this contract, that cooperative purchasing venture members or CPD members, of which most of the cities are, and many of the school districts are already members, will all be um, eligible for this contract um, either through this collaborative. Or as an individual, and in use of the contract also. And we think that we are probably the first that I know of, I can found them again, uh, another state that's actually worked on a collaborative. So it's sort of new for our office of state procurement. It's also um, new for its states, but I think it's the right thing to do. I know many of you know what an RFP is. Uh, just what, the, what it is, but what it does, I think, is probably important. I had the same thing that many of you had. I had many people coming to me at Camp Ripley and saying, I want to put solar on your site, or I want you to participate in different programs. It was hard for me to be able to um, benchmark one program against another. So, an RFP gives you competitive and transparency, it streamlines the process. And in this case, you get the contract experience of the Office of State Procurement. Which works downstairs in my building as part of the Department of Administration, and they do about two billion dollars in contracts per year. So that's a lot of experience to be able to uh, to look at. Um, the RFP also pre-qualifies the vendors, which is important. Making sure people that you're working with have experience and have um, the knowledge to do what you have to do. Uh, the RFP will also elicit competitive proposals from people in, in this case, uh, we'll see how we how to set that up, but uh, it sets price ceilings as it relates to different sample installations 
and then sets the minimum requirements for what we're looking for in the uh, solar installation. So we've used a uh, search example, hierarchy. We use the National Renewable Energy Laboratories example. And we've used other examples from other states that sort of provide the environment. So the RFP specifies some specific items. That's the warranties on production, the performance of panels, um, setting up the efficiencies and the quality of the materials given, and gives some construction details, such as um, types of mounting, mounting required, um, some of the codes that need to be followed, and the standards that need to be included. It also includes, in this case, uh, there's an executive order out for state agencies, and pollinator friendly. Uh, installation, so we do a brown mount installation. That's also a huge part of the master RFP. Uh, the RFP solicits the both the design, so this is design and build. We want to do the name of that uh, discussion, so design and engineering work. So there's requirements if you're doing rooftop um, installation, there's requirements for your roof to be enforced or so forth. That's envisioned as part of the RFP itself. Uh, the installation talks about the modules, and the types of modules, and the system requirements also. We do envision the first year that the installer will be responsible for both the operation and, and also for the maintenance for the first year. After that, we're going to put a second master contract in place to be able to extend that in the first year if you so desire. So that will be something that will be available to CPD members if the government's in the future. We just haven't gotten that, that far yet. Um, we divided the RFP into four categories. Today we're talking about people in the South service area, but we also included the ability to be able to provide proposals for the Minnesota power, the modern field power, and then for the communities and the rural cooperatives, they can either take them collectively or they can break out specific ones that they'd like to do. Again, what we're looking for is you know, some of the question that was asked earlier, if there's specific credits or rebates that are from those service areas that would be included as part of the proposal and be shown somewhere in the proposal. And we expect the well, seller to actually request those rebates for those credits that are associated. Um, in our RFP, which is sort of the that we have three conceptual um, installations. We have a ground mount installation, a low slope, a flat roof installation, and a fixed roof installation. And what we did there is we get feedback from the installer on what types of materials we use in these caves and how they see the installation going and what those costs would be. We see that as helping us sort of set the ceiling as it relates to the per watt prices that we see going forward. So the outline of the RFP itself for the master RFP has the special terms and conditions that are insurance requirements, which could help protect not only the state of Minnesota, but all the local governments that are involved. It talks about the specifications and very much detailed and technical requirements. The design services that are going to be provided, how we're going to evaluate the RFPs. So that's something that I think we care of and easier for you. And then last book is required what's needed as a proposed for the master plan. Vendor selection will be scoring the RFPs and seeking a minimum of two vendors for each one of those four service areas that you're looking that we talked about earlier. Um, this will uh, create a formal legal relationship between ourselves and the vendors. So, when we do go to do the site specific RFP, which is what Cody's going to talk about, then we already know that the vendors, who we're working with, who they're going to be, and so forth. Again, the intent would be to get two or more for each one of those service areas. We did send out the, uh, the RFP advertisement to over 100 different installers. So we're expecting to have a good response to this. about scoring itself. There's um, five areas. The acceptance of terms and conditions, because it is an RFP, 
team that could actually ask to modify those so that we actually get support on that. We talked about the installers' experience and qualifications as it relates to what's in the RFP, the quality of the products uh, that they're proposing, which are high uh, point value. Their, their uh, discussions as it relates to reverse inclusion, and that could be in their staffing, it could be in their subcontractors, it could also be in the materials that they're producing for procuring. Uh, if they can show reverse inclusion, which is a question we've done here, security items going forward. You see here that the cost component is not large in the master RFP. This will be a significant change once we get from site specific part. Uh, really, what we're trying to do for the master is qualify the contractors so we know what we're working with. And again, the, the contractors will look forward with the contractors that can actually perform in all the areas that we've asked them to do. There are additional points available for targeted groups, um, economically disadvantaged, and the veterans. And those are the campus sports as we look forward. The four phases that are talked about in the left, left hand side of the process that will on behalf of all the project members. Uh, actually, we'll go through the finals. We'll be selected. We'll probably bring in the finals. We'll do some kind of interview process on this stuff. And then we'll negotiate the sign contracts. So, some dates here. You're going to see more dates in just a moment. But uh, the answer RFP was advertisement went out on the 2nd of February. Again, it took 18 months to put the RFP together, so there's a lot of thought process behind it. We went out uh, recently and extended the date for responses. And right now, the new date is the 23rd of March. And um, after the responses come in, we'll do the evaluation as a process of the previous slide. That master contract then is set. We'll know who the contractors are that we're working with in each one of those different areas. Again, our intent is to have two or more. Each one of the, each one of those areas in the so that we can still have competition as we move to the site specific part. With that, we'll let Jared take over. Yes. All right. So now I'm just going to try to illustrate a bit the process where we go. I just want to You're fine, but I want to take your time and hold it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so just uh, describing the process from the master contract to then the site specific RFPs, these are the nuts and bolts of where these installations will be. Um, now, this dashed line right here, uh, it's not, I would love to think it's, it's that simple. We can just jump from the master RFP into the site specific. Um, but there's a lot of work in organization uh, to cross that boundary. And that um, is something in process that uh, Trevor has alluded to. In, continuing to discuss that. Um, but uh, just very simply, I don't have dogs, but I have process. Um, <laughs> I have uh, infographics. Uh, so here I have a map of Minnesota. This is just showing it's kind of a um, white color, but uh, the blue here is cell territory. So we look at specific sites, see what we hear, um, see looking over there from different parties. We take all of those sites and we combine them into one site-specific RFP. Uh, that contains all of the agreements, all the terms, everything from the master contract, and then submit that. Um, all right, so then we then collect uh, a number of different information and data to then include in that site-specific RFP. Uh, so this will require a bit of legwork on the part of the participants in Solar Fossil uh, because we want to uh, really screen sites um, so that we can include uh, the best performing solar sites um, into the site-specific RFP. Uh, so we want to look at Things like the general location. Uh, where is it? What is the orientation? If it's going to be a rooftop, is it south facing the uh, to put PD up there? Uh, we want to look at yeah, the square footage, uh, make sure there's unobstructed space. Uh, we want to look at the solar resource data. Um, 
there's a really convenient app that we'll point you to later um, that will allow you to address the shading and uh, the actual amount of solar insulation that's in that specific site. Uh, we want to look at specific ground mounts and rooftop data. So when will your rooftop be replaced? It's a really important consideration. Uh, the type of construction, uh, can it structurally hold PV on top? Um, for ground mount, we want to look at things like the use of the land. Um, is there a lot of specific type of farming around? Um, would you have any issues with the neighbors or other tenants? Um, and then we want to look at things like utility bills. So to assess the financial performance of your uh, potential site, we want to look at volume of energy consumption that you have in your site and uh, what your demand charts look like. Um, it's so critical to the financial performance is your ability to shave those peak demands um, and pair the PV with your um, actual energy. Uh, yeah. Um, well, the, the install in so the question again, if those didn't hear it. Is whether it's storage, so like battery storage, will, will be included, and the answer is that uh, vendors are they are allowed to you know, submit storage, battery storage, as a part of their proposal, as a part of their solution. Um, so, with the process, we gather all this information um, in, about these specific sites into the site-specific RFP. Uh, we then send that out to the master contractors. That have already been awarded part of that first initial process. Uh, they are then invited to uh, site visits. So they go to the building and inspect the electrical um, systems. They, they look at the actual buildings. Uh, and then they issue their responses. And at this phase, then we go back to the second round of evaluation. We look at the responses. And at this point, the pricing and the financing carry much greater weight. 40 to 60 percent. We haven't uh, set the final point rating yet, but it will take much uh, greater importance. We then do the final scoring and negotiations, and then at the end, uh, we have a negotiation uh, conclusion. And we award that whole bulk of uh, projects in the site specific RFP to uh, preferably one contractor. Uh, we will be giving preference to a contractor that can service all of the sites. So the outcomes, um, we have all the agreements in the master contract. We do allow for negotiated price deviations. Um, so again, we, we expect that the master contract prices are to be honored uh, as price ceilings. Um, but there is room for deviations below, uh, hopefully below. Um, um, and also above, uh, for example, a boost up transformer or something like that is needed. Um, and, and the main outcome, then again, is the uh, best cash price for all and best finance, which would come in the form of a PPA. Um, but we have not set in stone what that finance should look like. And I would caveat: these are just examples. These are not <laughs> these are not prices that are <laughs> they're there yet. It's just an example. Um, and with that, we can entertain any questions.
most part that we the church of are the church The risk as far as producing it, probably improves it for the department of the So, what the stadium is using is a lot of the stadium. The stadium is a For examples, you have to do that. You want to be able to do responses to that. You want to be able to do as many as possible in the next year contract. And then try to determine from that. You have to have some value for pricing. You can do that as many as possible. Okay. Any other I think that goes back here. I think it's maybe thirty percent of the master contract. So really, that's what the master contract is looking for. We want to make sure we have the most experienced, qualified people that have the greatest capability that they can. We we would like to work with one vendor, but in reality, I think we've had some questions from the vendors you know, that they're experts in the ground mount. So we might end up with a situation where the ground mount homes. You know, their expertise is so great that they might be picked as a vendor in one of the service areas, which I still think is a benefit to to you as a CPD member, because you will get that benefit of that. And usually, if they're, if they're an expert in an area, they're going to get better pricing and support for the components that they install. So, so the master we envision selecting is two or more vendors within uh, each one of the service areas at one time. Um, we've had to extend it recently to some of the some of the service areas we do a lot of response to, so we've been trying to actively get responses in some of the bringing the solar areas. Um, but we looked at doing the master once, and we looked at doing the site specific and times over for state agencies and uh, collaboratives, possibly in other areas that make sense in the future. Um, we would like to do that. I'm going to just say I think nope. that's probably beyond the scope of this particular request, just based on the master RFP, really trying to qualify at that sort of solar design and install level. I mean, I think that that's an interesting question and something that people might get more information being involved with this process that would inform how to go forward in another round, but I'm guessing it can't. Let's take one more question right now, and then we'll, we'll have more time for questions. I could, I could, yeah, I could. On parsing though, that an RFP must specify types of data acquisition and information system that we want. Um, so that should give flexibility to integrate the new system with other other building automation systems. Uh, Eric, I've been sort of um, we've been working with the state on previous opportunities to the question about whether Public facilities and public land development is in some finance problems. Is that something that could have been addressed uh, by the state or other than the agency where someone can ask for some opportunity? Right now, I'm kind of working with the uh, on that question. Uh, a lot of this is going to come back to the types of responses that I receive. So I'm sort of waiting. 
have specific be theoretical to them, it's sort of hard to get a response. Mm -hmm. So once I get the responses to the master contract, that'll be some of the things I'll be personally responsible for as to what what is and what is not um, eligible. I think by us owning it, I think it, it actually helps me a lot from that standpoint. Uh, but I think we can still be creative in the way we're releasing the PKs and so forth to be able to give some of those other uh, positive Sorry, I was typing. I'm trying to type what, what you all are asking and the responses. Okay, Trevor, we're coming back to you because now you're all like, okay, I'm getting a sense of what we're talking about, or hopefully you're getting a sense of what we're talking about. So we're going to go into the next step, which is really, what do you need to do to participate? Thank you. And just to frame this, uh, we talked about a whole uh, list of options for clean energy action at the government level. Uh, then we talked about five different tiering, five different tiering, and the master contract. Now we're talking about this specific opportunity. So this is a joint procurement opportunity being issued to those pre-qualified members in the master contract process. Um, and so here are the phases of this. Uh, one. If you're interested in being part of this, we would love just a casual note of interest. By casual, I mean just sending a one sentence email to the old term saying, yeah, we think we're interested, uh, we want to participate. Uh, or if you think, yeah, this really isn't a fit, we would love to know that as well. We just want to start from the page in how many uh, entities are interested in being part of this. And uh, that we are looking for by the end of this month. Uh, after that, if you're interested, we would love to get a more formal but non-binding letter. And it's up to you who signs that. Uh, just make sure that it's you know, whatever you need to be the proper level of authority. We have a draft letter of intent that was available at the table when you walk in. Uh, it's a draft because we haven't finalized that uh, the Department of Administration will be the procurement need yet they will, but we'll need to send out a final uh, But basically this just says we're interested in being part of this. Uh, we would like to purchase solar for at least one site if we got to offer, and we agree to the general terms of the process. Uh, after that, so those would be due at the end of April, we will have a webinar and be providing technical assistance with uh, site self evaluation. So, information that you can collect about your site to determine if they are the best And again, we're going to be providing assistance with that process. So, we're going to be trying to build expertise for you. Uh, that information will be collected. That's all part of this first kind of signing up. After that, uh, the procurement lead will take those sites, include them in this mini RFP that's being issued, it's a site specific RFP that's being issued to those pre qualified members. Um, we, while the RFP is out, we are looking to coordinate the site. It's important that developers have a chance to come with the site. It is our job to work with you all to make that process of scheduling those sites. Site visit very streamlined and easy uh, so that it's not, it's not complicated. We're planning to find sort of a good, supported way to do that. Uh, so then the procurement lead will go through this evaluation and selection process. As Larry said, uh, there are kind of two possibilities here. One is that there would be just one vendor picked for the whole group. Another is that uh, sites could be bundled depending on their characteristics. And some vendors uh, might have better proposals for those. Uh, and then lastly, those proposals will be provided to participants. Um, I can say at this point that in terms of uh, what you can do in response to that proposal, it will be somewhere between only yes or no to uh, maybe a slight opportunity for negotiation on some of the terms. And one of the reasons for that is we need to wait and see what comes back. And we need to be talking to the members to figure out what they're thinking about with such a large group of sites. Okay, uh, after that, so you've, you've gone through the process. You've got the proposal in front of you. This is sort of your no consequence exit opportunity. So you can look at this and say, yeah, it was great to be part of this, uh, but it's not the right timing for us, or we don't like this offer. We're out. There's no penalty for doing that. Um, obviously, we'd love it to be, if you move forward, and we want to get to the point where we get offers that are favorable to everybody, but I want to be really clear that you 
the hardware process for that one. Uh, if you decide to move forward, then you'll be signing uh, with a vendor and then you move towards information. So you'll be working with that vendor to coordinate the installation. Uh, we're looking at installations happening as soon as it, it could be end of this year, maybe spring of next year. Uh, and then we would have a review, uh, we would sort of survey, and a celebration. Uh, yay! <laughs> <laughs> so let me point out just a few of the handouts that correspond to this process. Uh, we talked about the draft letter of intent. You also have a uh, this preliminary solar site assessment checklist. We're providing this now, uh, not that we want you to go home and just start uh, filling this out, but just to give you a sense for the kind of information we're going to be talking about in that lab. What sort of info might we want you to collect? So you can start thinking about sites. Um, and, and you'll see in that draft letter of intent, we're asking you to list out the site that you want to evaluate, but potentially put in detail. So you don't have to have done the evaluation procedures. You have to say, yeah, the city hall and the fire station or these school buildings. Uh, and then we have this solar possible, just the overview, so the details of this process. On the black side of that, we have the time. So some of the dates I just stated are on that sheet. Uh, we, so there are sort of two pressures on the time. One is that uh, government entities tend to move slow. There are checks and balances, so we need to provide enough time to get through those. Uh, the other pressure is that we want to move fast enough to uh, make people excited about being part of this process. So we're trying to balance those. Uh, we, we think this is a doable but progressive timeline, and we'd actually love to hear from you along the way if it's too fast or what we want to do. So, and then just to clarify, key next steps if you want to be part of this. Casual note of interest, Peter Lindstrom. By March 30th, we'll send out this email. I saw people taking pictures of the slides, and they'll also send out this slide. So we'll uh, letters of intent would then be due in April, and in May, we'll be having a state assessment. And with that, I think we can go to questions. Okay. Yes, so we will repeat the questions. Oh. So that was a good question. Why don't we, yes, we can grab chairs. Yeah. Yeah. Let me try to recap the question and then you all can respond. Okay, so in brief, the question is, for a particular city, they have multiple different sites, multiple different roof ages for the different sites, and they're getting multiple different responses in terms of how it would be handled to take the panels off, do the roof replacement, and then put the panels back on, how much that costs, who bears the cost, how it's rolled into the contract, yada, yada. Okay. And second, roof, war roof warranty, and then the roof warranty before and after, I suppose. Um, okay, go. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you, uh, there are probably some categories of questions. So there are some questions we can probably answer today. <laughs> there are some questions we may need to follow up with, and there may be some suggestions uh, to put in your team. My colleague, Kristen, is capturing all of your questions so that we can make sure to follow up on them. Um, and then there may be some questions that I was talking about beforehand uh, that are more about, less about this specific opportunity, more about technical assistance and what you're thinking about. We would be happy to take all of those questions, but we may you know, be able to only answer so much. I mean, I think noted, and we understand that that needs to be something that we can do. Okay, let's go ahead and 
go over here in front and then we'll confirm it back. So the question was, are there financing options included in the program and is the PPA going to be included? So there is. The uh, last slide we're looking at them. We're looking for both the cash price and we're looking for their best financing option from the actual call. So that could be an option to say, I would like to do the cash and I'll do the company third party financing or I've got a grant or whatever. Install or I'm interested in what you have to be your best best deal that you can do for finances and relates to the package. So you have both items. This vendor is going to be evaluating and will be passing on you the best the best opportunity that we get back. And we've been, we've, as Pete mentioned early on, in the process that we've been exploring with Woodbury, we've been really trying to figure out for us what is it that's imperative to ask about the financing and to understand the sort of escalator degradation and all of that. And so those are the things that would be included in the site specific RFP to make sure that we're getting back on the financing side the apples to apples as much as we can for comparison as well. Okay, I'm going to go here and then here and then I'll come back to you. So it was a question of clarification for folks on the webinar about at what point in the process is the geologic review for the ground mount and the roof assessment for the roof mount as in terms of a go no go. So in, for the ground mount, we envision the uh, soil borings and so forth to be done by the city ahead of time for the area that we're proposing. Uh, that will get that will be uh, actually given as part of the site specific RFP so that the vendor needs to Roof evaluation really is going to come part as part of the on site evaluation that uh, the sellers from the master contract when they come to your site, at the closer site, they'll actually have to have the capability to have someone, an engineer or whatever it is, to take a look at the rooftop to make sure it has the structural capability to be able to handle the roof and weight and so forth. So that it's to remove any corrections or so forth will need to be included as part of their response. Okay, in short, the question was, what about potential incentives that are only just potential and depend upon applying in a timely fashion to be awarded those? How do we include those in the actual responses that we get back from installers to understand the economics? Well, okay, so everything that's utility driven is needs to be included and clearly indicated in both the cash price and in the financing so that we know that all the credits, the rebates, and anything else that's given by the utility is included and we expect the actual installer to, on your behalf, to help you, either help you assist you to get those and so forth, that they'll maximize, and that was one of the reasons we went with different uh, utility providers for uh, picking the personnel. Because we have people that are, are used to working in Otter Tail, used to working in Minnesota Power, we felt that was most effective. For the department, you're talking now, you're talking about the state program for? Well, the Fleeting Minneapolis Cattle Program, the mm -hmm. Story Board Program, mm -hmm. all of the kind of application based for the health first year. So I, I'll just say, go ahead. Oh, um, well, I, in the master contract level, we have asked that they uh, state, like they have to list it in the price sheet what those incentives are, and that you know, they, they don't. And in the second round, if they don't get those incentives, uh, unfortunately, they'll bear that, that burden, that cost. And at that second round, 
they submit that price and they are saying 100% certain they're going to have this uh, incentive at ADH. Well, and I, so, and just to add to that, I mean, I think what we need is for the contract to state what the, the exit clauses are. And part of that should be if they have incentives come. We just need that to be clear up front. So when you're signing, you know if those incentives fall out and the economics of your project are dependent on those incentives, then you're out, no penalty. Yeah. Yeah. Part of the reason we're starting an Excel third party is because we have the solar capacity problem, which is, it does make it more appealing for the yeah. Okay. That's you. I've not forgotten you. Yep. Super. Let me recap your question. So, for folks online, the question was really about people having their own very specific list of other things that you're concerned about. It totally makes sense. And this one was specifically about putting on new roofs as opposed to old roofs. And to whom do I send my questions? You can send them to Peter Lindstrom and Trevor Drake. Happy both. Um, we have we have business cards, and we'll send out email addresses along with all of the follow-up information so that you have that. And and then we'll start compiling your questions as Kristen has already been doing today. And our contact information is on the back of that over the sheet. I included Pete's cell phone and his home phone. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Question. Uh, I know um, Peter and I talked about this where most people are in terms of facility people, so then you also have your community development people. A lot of these rooftop projects would be kind of a way of the city demonstrating momentum so that residents can try to do the same. And so with the comp plan happening, um, we're going to be having cities that have actually put in actual energy strategies and goals in your best content so that you can see them. And then also talking about how cities can work together during the PUC legislature. So, Sean, here, one of you is handing something around. Oh, you're just handing something around. Yeah. Okay. So, Sean is handing something around. Sorry, folks on the phone, we'll take a picture of it or something and try to send it to you. Okay, Leah. One hopefully quick is like a canopy. On the ground, considered ground mount. Like, you know, a carport canopy. Is that considered ground mount? Um, so the question was, is a canopy on the ground considered a ground mount? Canopies are actually included as part of the master RFP, so okay. it, it would be a variation for ground mount. But yes, canopies are in vision. Okay. Okay. In the back, shout out to the So the question was, can we get a copy of the presentation? Absolutely, we'll email it out to everybody as a PDF. Right? And, and we're recording also, so there will be a YouTube video as well. Yeah. 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 Okay, so the question was, back to the timeline and how that syncs up with budgeting processes that local jurisdictions have to go through and when they would know about financing options, yada, yada. Okay. Trevor? Uh, well, so, correct me if this is wrong. But it, so, that would come back as a response to the RFP and uh, after the negotiation. So, we'd be looking at about August. And then you'd have about two months to evaluate and decide. So, uh, it may be that it doesn't line up with the budgeting process. And in that case, you might look at a power purchase agreement because it doesn't require an upfront investment. What can be helpful, though, is when I get the master contract responses back and you figure out who the installer is. Our installers, you at least have some ceiling prices 
to be able to work with for your budget. We're, it's our intent to collaborative that the actual site specific RFP would have either will need that or will be something less than that amount. So from a budgeting standpoint, you should have something to work with once we get the master contract results back and the vendor selected. Can I throw it back to you? From my experience, August seems like a an okay time frame for budgeting purposes that you need to get solidified in the fall, at least we do. Um, does that jive with uh, with your experiences as well? Or is that a problem? So, so the question is really just, I think, the essence is, how do we make sure that we get all, all of the right information to the right decision makers so they have time enough to really consider it before moving forward? And does the timeline allow for that? So, go ahead. I just Maybe just to help respond to that. So uh, one of the reasons we have all of these steps in the timeline is to iteratively start talking to decision makers. So that's why we have this, this sort of casual note of interest is really you all who are here today, like, yeah, I'm going to be talking to our decision makers about this. That formal letter of intent is the first opportunity to bring this up and to get them on board. And that's why it's non-binding, right? We want to get involved, but we're still figuring this out. Um, so we'll be sort of doing this step by step as we go in the hopes that that actually helps you communicate with decision makers. That is also uh, our role is to help provide assistance with those communications. So we can provide a, a presentation template. We can provide some handouts that sort of talk about the process, hopefully in a way that really helps you do your job. And I, I guess I'll just add one other quick thing. I mean, if you all look at the timeline, and I know it was up briefly, so you know, you'll know you get it again. If when you get the timeline, you have grave concerns, it would, it would naturally be better for us to hear about that now than at the end of August. And we welcome your feedback. I mean, this is this is a process, and you as participants would be part and parcel of the process. So we need to get that feedback from you as we go. Thank you. Yeah, we, we really want to make this accessible. Like I said, you know, we want it to be fast enough so folks feel like they can be part of this and actually get it done. We don't want it to be too fast. We don't want it to be so burdensome that you can barely uh, get approval to move So we kind of talked about this one time frame, but you know, based on what the state is saying, they're going to have multiple reiterations of being able to jump on board. Is this time frame like a one-shot deal, or do we have like next year we're going to run the same similar time frame for the people that maybe have a roof that's two years out or three years out, or is going to be replaced this summer and will be available for a solar next year because it's one of these long time. So, so the question was about, is this sort of one of 20x, whatever that is? You know, is this the first option and maybe we'll do another one next year and the year after? So I think it's two ways. One depends on you know, sort of the feedback you receive here. And if this goes really well and we save a lot of money, I think it'll create a lot of interest. <laughs> That'll actually help me to sell it to some of my agencies because that's my, my job I have to do internally. Um, so I know for sure we, I'd like to do this at least once in each one of the four areas that we talked about. Um, but if there's success, I think we can come back to this and try to bring in more agencies. The big benefit to you is for this first push, you're going to have some help from buildings on the capital complex, which are going to set a baseline number that's going to probably get people excited, some of the vendors excited about some numbers, and uh, hoping to track a lot of your participation also get the, the total uh, plot installed up there to the point where it really gets people excited about looking for this kind of thing. Uh, I think I'll just add to that this metaphor that an elephant for a dime is only a good deal if you need an elephant and you have a dime. 
That's a metaphor that everyone here uses every day. With a lot of clean energy projects, there's a question of what is, uh, how does this offer now compare to an offer we might get? And the answer is always we don't know. So what you really have to do is decide, is this a good deal for meeting our goals right now? Uh, we would love to do more iterations of this if it's really successful. We also, to be able to provide technical assistance and build this process, uh, we have to do some fundraising. So the McKnight Foundation is supporting this effort. Um, and, and that is not guaranteed to be there. So, um, so it's kind of a question of you, is this a right fit for you right now? And if not, this master contract will be available. So you can always build off of this individually. So the master contract is set up for one year? With four additional one year terms that could be added to it. So potentially, if you have five years, if you don't like the contractors in the first year, you get rid of them, go through the process again, get better contractors involved. And so on. So Larry mentioned this, but I just want to hammer home. We could do it again, but we may do it in Minnesota College here, mm -hmm. which wouldn't really help kind of account for that. Or at all. <laughs> <laughs> So, so just real quickly, the, the, the question was just, is it possible to participate in this process and get to the end where you sign a contract and then push it back so that you could mitigate other challenges that you might have before you actually get to the install itself? So I think if we're up front and we cite specific RFP and if we tell them from your site we're looking at this specific building at this time, then I think it would be all right to do that. But I think we owe it to the installers up front so that they can schedule their work and know when things are going to happen and so forth. And to answer someone's question about roofs, what we did in the capital complex is I took it, we, we took every roof that was within the next 10 years as eligible and we considered what roofs we could put on. And we're just accelerating the process and actually replacing the roofs that need to in the next 10 years. We kept the roofs that were outside the 10 years out of there unless they were like grants bank and them. Um, so that's sort of the process. We, so we, we expect that there may be other buildings that are considered in the capital complex in the future, but not right now based on the, uh, the life left in the road itself. the concern for the for the jurisdiction was that they were going to have to pay for the power even though they weren't actually getting power production during the lost production time when the solar was removed before it was reinstalled. Yeah? I think the roofing is a really big issue now you have a new roofing contract where it's maybe a balance they don't score it and then you know, they're talking about just moving out when you don't have to go on a new roofing space. The shorthand answer for what that was is roof equals complicated. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I guess more of a technical thing, but most of the contractors that we work with will work with the company who get a letter that states that the system was called to make There'll still be like a disappearance clause, but um, at least with no other. Let me just add uh, one of the things I like about this process having the master contract with pre qualified developers is that there really are some questions that are best answered by the solo developers. And sometimes you, as some of you have experienced, sometimes you get different answers. But in this case, we will have a small group of pre qualified developers to work with. So as some of these uh, in depth logistical questions come up, we can actually bounce that off of them during the process so that we're not just putting out the RFP and hoping we get a suitable answer. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. Hearing none, let me recap what we're going to send to you. <laughs> we're going to send you a copy of the presentation so that you have that and have more details in terms of what was discussed as well as the timeline and all of that. We will also send out the handouts that were here today. So there's the intro piece that's the one pager that has both Trevor and Keith's email addresses on the back so you can send them your questions. That will also allow you to have Keith's email address so that if you want to send us an email by the end of this month, you can say, hey, yeah, we're interested. We're going to keep going in this direction. You'll also get the, the checklist that shows the kinds of data that we're going to ask you to collect as part of the process, and you'll get the sample letter of intent that you would need to then have to us, again, as named on the timeline. Other things we're going to send that I missed. Okay. No? Yeah. We're not sending you cash. <laughs> there will be no cash, but there is a photo of cash as well as pictures of posts. So, <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, anything further? Yes, I'm sorry. There. So, um, We've extended the master contract time one time. Um, I know there are contractors online and in the room. Uh, we'd like to see more participation as it relates to the contractors and moving towards the master contract. We have had interest, but I, based on the fact that we sent this out to 101 installers, I think it was, uh, not as many as we would have liked. So the date right now is the 23rd of March. Uh, the process is pretty straightforward. You just have to be a state con uh, contractor registered and go through the process of putting it in. It is a statewide contract. So this is not just this collaborative here, but this is the state of Minnesota. You can decide on what areas you want to install in. I think that's good because you can sort of have your destiny. If you can't do all three styles of installation, you can say that. Again, we prefer contractors that actually can do all three. 23rd of March is the date. Looking for as many uh, contractors as possible to make this as competitive as possible uh, overall. With that in mind, should we get the link from you where people can go and read the RFP and understand sure. where to respond? We could send that out to all of you, mm -hmm. and then if all of you have already been talking to installers, which many of you mentioned, you might share it with the folks with whom you're working as another means of communicating to them that you're thinking about the process. And you also can share with other um, counties, cities, and school districts because this will be available to all of them. If there's anybody that else would be interested in the collaborative or just the master contract in the future, maybe in another service area. All right. With that, let's give our speakers a round of applause.